happy that you guys are here today so that we can praise God together. Let's uh, go ahead and stand together. We're going to enter into some uh, praise and worship. And uh, let's say a, a quick prayer before we go here. God, we welcome you in this place. We are so thrilled to commune with you today. And to give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise, God, for everything that's um, good in our lives, for everything that uh, we are even facing, Father. We know that when we face trials of many kinds, we can consider it pure joy. And we just thank you for that. We just pray right now that you will take over this service. Let it be yours today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so forgive me, we do not have a drummer for this song, but it's a goodie, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Feel free to clap your hands if you feel comfortable.
Boy, you can't, you can't outdo the old ones, huh? The old ones are pretty good, aren't they? And such truth, such truth in those old hymns. And uh, we do have the victory. Whether we believe it from day to day or not, we do have the victory. And it's all in Jesus' name. upon the waters the great unknown where feet may fail and there I find you in the mystery in oceans deep my faith will stand singing I will call upon your name and I above the waves and keep my eyes above the waves sing it out when oceans rise when oceans arise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you never failed and you won't start now sing I will call
I will call. that today that we are his and he is ours think about that for a minute it's not just that we're his and that we're bought on a cross bought and paid for so that we could be his but he gave himself back to us and he is ours Amen. our secret weapon I like to keep tucked in there mm -hmm if we ever need it. You know, I was talking to the team this morning and we were talking about um, about how the cross and the sacrifice that was made there took away or set us free from religion and gave us relationship. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, they said the veil was torn. And when I was a kid, I always thought, well, that wouldn't be too hard. That's just a wedding veil that's torn. That's not that hard. Um, but no, that's not what it was. It was a veil that was so thick that no man could have torn that veil. In fact, it was made to protect people from God's presence. It was made to protect people from God because you literally, if you entered in there and you weren't ready, you would die. And they'd have a rope tied to your leg and they'd pull you out. <laughs> Come on, y'all. That, that's some serious power in the presence of God. And the day that he died on the cross, he broke that religion and he opened that possibility for us to enter into his presence and have a relationship with him. To know him like a husband and a wife. Think about how well you know your husband or you know your wife or um, if you're not old enough for that, your parents or, you know, it's amazing that God took that away and made it possible for us to enter into his presence. So we're gonna sing a song we did last week. But I just, I would encourage you guys to just close your eyes and focus on that relationship with him. It's not about song service. You guys, I don't wanna bust your bubble. But I'm not here for song service. I'm here to enter into the presence of God. And I'm here to take you guys with me, if you want to. Light of the world, you stepped down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Take it, Allie. You
that you're a believer in Jesus and you believe that Jesus died and gave his body and gave his blood for our redemption um, since our, our pandemic um, that we've been facing we do it a little different now so um, you can come up and gather your uh, elements and then take them back to your seat and take them whenever you'd like to in this song if you'd like to get together with your family and say a little prayer, do that. Um, if you'd like to, you know, uh, reach out to someone else um, to minister to them, do that. Um, but right now we are going to just enter into uh, this last song and uh, we'll allow you to come up and, and get your elements of communion. Make me a 
Um, normally we do a potluck where we throw all the food, but due to the COVID, just bring your own, bring your own place setting, and we'll just enjoy eating together with whatever we have. Um, and then Saturday night, the same thing. After we're done eating, Pastor Eric is going to give a brief message. He said it would be brief, so we're thinking less than an hour. <laughs> Um, and he'll do that on Friday and Saturday night. So please come and join us for a night of fun and worship. We'll have some yard games out there if the kids want to play. Hopefully we'll be where there's a nice grassy area. Um, Vacation Bible School will be a week from tomorrow. It'll run from 9.30 to 11.30, um, Monday through Friday. We are trying to get pre-registration so that we can keep the kids in small groups and keep that group together. There will not be a program at the end due to the fact of having so many people in one place. Uh, the last announcement, a marriage retreat. Now don't panic. It's not because you and your husband are fighting or you and your spouse need marital counseling. It's just an opportunity for married couples to get away. And that will be October 16th and 17th. It will be at the Old Straw Town in Pella. Um, Pastor Eric and Delaney have had an opportunity to have supper with the man that is, and his wife that are actually going to be hosting that, and uh, I think it's going to be a nice weekend to spend. Um, it'll be a Friday night, Saturday morning, I believe. So, uh, more details for that later. With Vacation Bible School, I forgot to mention, we are still in need of a few things. There is a list of those things in your bulletin, so be sure and check that. Thank you. All right, kids, it's time for part two of Roxy and the Ritzy Camel. I know y'all are excited. All right, so I need Micaiah and Isaiah up here for sure. I think that's it. Unless anybody else wants to be a big kid today. And anybody online, we're going to keep doing these. Do you guys remember where we left off? She was trying to, she was trying to get her hind end through the door. She was having troubles, wasn't she? But partly was because she had all those things piled up on her back, didn't she? Okay. So the white dove was telling them telling her that she needs to get rid of some of her things to be able to get into this place where they had all this water and these, these lush, beautiful things going on in there. And she needed that water, but she didn't want to do it. So she says, what? What's that you say? The shocked camel said, give things away. I'd rather be dead. No, thank you, said Roxy. I'll try once more, but this time I'll charge like a big wild boar. You remember that from last week? So backing away from where the gate stood, she started to run as fast as she could. She hit the stone gate with quite a loud thump and shot like a rubber band right on her rump. Oh no, sobbed poor Roxy. I'll never get through. What can I try? I haven't a clue. Please listen to me, repeated the dove. Please do what I say, he asked her with love. Your riches don't matter. Their value's not great. They're, they're, unless, they're useless to you once you pass through this gate. It's nice to have things, and they can be good as long as you treat them the way that you should. You're being too selfish and not very smart to love them with all of your soul and your heart. That kind of love is for heaven alone. It's not for the things that you buy on your own. So share all your things or give them away. Listen and you'll be so happy today. Down deep in her heart, the rich camel knew she loved her possessions too much. It was true. And so she decided to give it a try and take all her treasures and kiss them goodbye. She made up her mind to give up her things 
to put all her faith in the great King of Kings. Hard to give up your things, isn't it? So down by the ground, she gave to the mules her bags filled with gold and big sparkling jewels. She gave to the fox, whose fur was a mess, her frilly white socks and bright silky dress. She gave to a slow and lonely old tortoise a diamond tiara that really looks gorgeous. She gave to some snakes A boy. <laughs> she gave to some snakes not known for their looks her collection of hats and posh pocketbooks. She gave to the lion, off taking a snooze, her bows and braids and box of shoes. And when she was done, she noticed that she was much more happy and so much more free. Her heart felt so light, her soul felt so bright. She danced and she floated like a butterfly in flight. Then squinting her eyes and starting to trot, she said to the dove, let's give this a shot. She rushed to the gate, but still it was tight. She squished and she pushed with all of her might. The little dove just watched, then flew around and said, try bowing down and going in on bended knees instead. That's the way, he cheered her. You're almost free and clear. All you animals get behind her and push her on the rear. They pushed and shoved together. They poked and prodded too. Then suddenly there was a pop, then Roxy made it through. Once inside the city, the camel looked around. She couldn't breathe and quite believe the beauty she had found. Valleys, vineyards, mountains, trees, rising in the air. Lakes and rivers, streams and seas, and water everywhere. Best of all, the king came forth and welcomed Roxy in. He said to her, well done, my friend. Your joy can now begin. No more thirsting, no more tears, no more pain or strife. In this land of happiness, forever you'll have life. And all the city gathered round and gave a thunderous cheer for Ritzy Roxy, rich with love, at last had made it here. The end. Was that a cool story? What did we learn? That we can't take all of our things into heaven, can we? And sometimes we need our friends to give us a big push <laughs> through the door. <laughs> all right, that's it for today, Search Kids. Let's go on. We're going to party in our room. Good? Yeah, all right, there we are. Good morning, now that you can hear me. How we doing? Good, good to see you guys this morning. Welcome to church, welcome home. Let me go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer and let's get, uh, let's get started, all right? Father God, thank you for another wonderful morning, Lord. We bless your name, God. We exalt you here this morning, Lord. With our words, with our worship, with our life. God, we invite your spirit in here with us today. God, bless us, be with us, Lord. Meet needs as needs need to be met, God. Enrich our faith, enrich our walk with you, Lord. Give us hearts that are fertile soil for your word and give us ears to hear, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I heard 
heard uh, something the other day, and I wanted to share it here this morning. There was um, a minister who was speaking to his congregation one time, and he said, next week, I plan to preach on the sin of lying. So to get prepared for that, what I'd like you to do is to go ahead, go home, and read Mark chapter 17, all right? The following Sunday, as he prepared to deliver his sermon, he got up and asked for a show of hands. All right, hey, who all went home and read Mark 17? And sure enough, hands dotted around the the sanctuary. The minister smiled and said, Mark only has 16 chapters. I will now proceed with my sermon on the sin of lying. I I make no promises I won't do something like that. (laughs) But we'll talk about promise a lot in today's message. This is going to be part three of our Blessing of Abraham series. So we're going to go ahead and conclude, wrap everything up as we, um, as we, uh, well, we're going to wrap up the series. So part of what we had discussed last week was the importance of dreams and promise within an Abraham style of faith, all right? Really grabbing hold of God's promises and not letting the environment and what's going on around us just simply dictate how we feel, how we live, and how our faith works out. And the uh, the illustration I had given was to be a thermostat, right? Not a thermometer. Thermostats set the environment, right? They change what's going on around them. Thermometers, on the other hand, just simply measure and just simply see what's going on around them, and that's all that they do. So they stop right there. Be the example that you want to see in the world, right? So for this week, the message has actually got a title. So we're within the Blessing of Abraham series, but I've called this one The Seed, the Altar, and the Well. And I do have to say, as I was putting this message together, um, at one point I, I just got really excited about the about what I had kind of found in there. And I went to Delana and I was like, hey... I don't know if you're going to be in the the service to be able to listen to this or not, but I got to tell you about this. And I was really excited and I'm bouncing up and down and everything. And she's like, okay, calm down a little bit. But this is just something that was really stirring in my spirit. I'm just really excited about. So I'm happy to share it with you here this morning. But each of those is going to be divided into three parts. All right. The seed, the altar, and the well. We're going to start with the seed. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're pretty close. Genesis 3, 15. It's going to be before Abraham, of course, but right after the fall of Adam and Eve. I will put hostility between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And he will strike your head, you will strike his heel. So there's two ways to go about understanding this, and ironically enough, the subject of snakes keeps getting brought up um, for reasons I won't talk about. <laughs> Can I get the joke? Okay. No? <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, um, one way we can understand this <laughs> is pitting serpents and snakes against mankind. All right? They're symbols of evil. They look mean. I mean, look at them. They're just, they slither around and you don't know what they're going to do. They're just kind of creepy. My wife wouldn't agree. She absolutely loves them. That's sarcasm. But I want one. And I can't seem to get convinced her to let me have one. Her rule is whatever pet or animal you get, if it gets out of the cage, I need to be able to put it back. And she refuses to touch a snake or a lizard or a reptile of any kind. So... I think I'm uh, out of luck there. But one thing about this interpretation is that it doesn't seem to grab hold of the bigger picture that's going on. As much as some people hate snakes, and you know what, to, there's a lot of superstitions, there's a lot of things that, you know what, they just creep us out, some of them are poisonous and dangerous. Um, as much as that, that's true, they don't seem to be amassing armies against us to my knowledge, or fighting mankind at every turn, right? They just slither about and kind of creep us out. 
So I don't think that that's, you know, that, that's not what, what's going on. I think that there's another thing here. There's a part two, there's a second way to read this. And it's that there's something going on with the seed talk. And that's what we need to grab hold of, right? So those are our two options. What I find interesting is the fact that with all this is being said, it's being said in the bigger context of what's going on at that time. Adam and Eve just sinned. They scarred creation. They ruined their relationship with God. It's been damaged. They're hurt. You know what? It's just, it's not a good picture. But despite all of that, despite all that being said, God issues a promise within the curse. Even in the judgment, there was mercy. And I think this is telling for a number of reasons. Look at God's response, right? He didn't abandon Adam and Eve and just say, you guys blew it. You messed up. I'm sorry. Poof, you're gone. And he didn't just give up on them at that point, right? That's not what happened. Yes, sin happened, and yes, it was terrible. But God never, ever abandoned them. We were separated. That we can be... We can safely say that we, our relationship with him was, was broken and it was in need of restoration, absolutely. But he never completely abandoned us. He pronounced judgment, yes, but at the same time declared a future for them. And I think that that's telling as God's ultimate role, or his nature, I guess I should say, as judge. He's the ultimate judge, but at the same time he is loving by nature. So it's not an, an extreme on either end. It, it is a balance between those two. He's both at the same time. And in our own life, I think sometimes we can get that balance kind of upset. We can view him as being too much of the judge side of things, you know, where I don't see how God can forgive me for that, or man, he's really, he's really going to be un unhappy with me when I, because of something that I did. And we can also go too far on the other end, where God is love, and it doesn't really matter what I do. You know what? He's going to love me. He's going to forgive me. And we can be go on too far on the, on the other end of the, the spectrum. He's both. We can't wait. There's a balance between those two things. As a matter of fact, all throughout the uh, Old Testament, we see this, this balance over and over again. We all love to quote Jeremiah 29, 11. For the note, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper, not to hinder. Some of us have that engraved on our hearts. Some of us have it on our, our kitchen walls and, and picture frames. But no, we don't ever quote what's going on around Jeremiah 29, 11, right? The not so good things that were happening at that time. Wherever you are right now, though, whatever the case may be, as long as you are on this side of heaven, on this side of eternity, you have a hope and a future, all right? Don't delay. Don't delay. Don't wait for tomorrow. Nobody is promised tomorrow. None of us. It doesn't matter how, we're, how old we are or anything like that. If we're healthy, if we're sick, it doesn't matter. None of us are promised tomorrow. Don't wait. Get to know him if you don't here today. And another thing I found interesting about this passage is that God is sovereign over all things past and future. All things past and future. I don't think Adam got up one day and said, life is pretty good right now. I think I'm going to sin. I think I'm going to do something to damage my relationship with God. He didn't make that, that conscious decision, you know, kind of premeditated, so to speak. But he did make the decision at some point, right? It happened. And that's the, the, the thing that I'm interested in here. We could blame Adam. We could blame Eve. We could blame the serpent. There's a lot of possibilities here. But I think the bottom line is that sin happened. And even though it happened, God had a plan as a ready response. Nothing is ever, ever going to catch him by surprise. I would even go so far as to say that I think God knew when he said, let there be light, that the very creatures that he would end up making later on would defy him and break the relationship that he would make. 
But he didn't sit around kind of shifting his hands saying, what am I going to do? I don't know how I'm going to fix this. These guys, that caught me off guard. I don't know what to do at this point. He had a plan. He's that intimate. He's that close to us that he often knows the details before the decision. And in it all, in it all, he put hope within that seed. Despite the catastrophe, despite the awfulness of sin, God promised redemption from what happened. So my question to you here today, kind of think about, is what seeds is God planting in your life? Of course, plants, crops, things of the sort don't just happen in an instant. They are delicate little things. They require a lot of nurturing, a lot of um, care, water. They, they, they're, they're brittle little things that, that, that something could easily come along if we're not careful and wipe that seed away. I found that out the hard way with my garden. I don't know what happened, but uh, something got a hold of some of our plants and just... Destroyed them. But if you're waiting on God right now for a breakthrough, if you're waiting on him for a victory in your life, start looking for seeds. And trust me when I say, if he plants it, it'll grow. He'll make sure that it comes into fruition. There's no uncertainty or worries about whether it'll bring forth a harvest if the Lord is the one that's planted. All right? The seed of blessing and promise given to Adam and Eve, despite their sin, was something that God was preparing to use to bless all mankind. It wasn't just them. God isn't intimidated by our mistakes or the mistakes of others. Nothing catches him off guard. He's the God who takes tragedy and turns it into majesty. In the moment, that may not feel like it. As a matter of fact, it may not even be a moment. It may be a couple moments. It may be days, weeks, months. It could be a couple years. You know what? That's something that I've grown to see from him over and over and over again, is that he always, always, always comes through. Hang on to that seed. Hang on to that promise. The second part here is the altar. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. I'll give you a second here to turn your Bibles there, but we also got it on screen as well. Beginning here in verse 5. He took his wife, Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. They set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. When Abraham entered the land that the Lord was going to give to him, he came to Shechem. It was at Shechem that God ended up confirming his promise to Abraham. And that Abraham turned around and did what? He built an altar. Altars aren't fun things. They're not things that you get excited about. Well, hopefully we don't have an altar nowadays, but in ancient times, in the Old Testament, they weren't things that you were happy about going to see necessarily. They were a place of death and a sacrifice. They were messy and gross. They probably stunk and had bugs and everything else around them. And nowhere in the Bible will you find that anyone was ever blessed at an altar until something was first killed and sacrificed to God upon that same altar. This is critical. And you're going to see why here in the next point as we get to it. But this would have been Abraham's place of atonement. 
right? It would have been a consistent reminder to him that sin merits death and that blood was required for the remediation of his sin. However, the seed of promise from Genesis was now going to Abraham in the form of a special blessing, a covenant, so that the whole world would be blessed. And what does he do in response? He creates an altar. Altars are where people can, they come to give something up. But what I find interesting is that Abraham didn't build an altar without reason. He built it as a response to the promise of God. In other words, it symbolizes the, the giving up of something on our end in exchange for something on God's end. How many times have we asked God personally for a breakthrough or blessing? But we don't let go of what we need to let go at the altar. Are you tired of, of worrying about what people think about you? Or you got, do you have like a, a people pleaser mentality maybe? Or are you battling with something? You're really wrestling with it, trying to get, get free. If you're asking God for a breakthrough of peace and triumph in your life, are you taking what's dragging you down? Are you taking the thing that needs to get put away and putting it at the altar in exchange for the blessing? Or are we holding on to the thing that needs to be sacrificed to begin with? We're, uh, we're funny like that as, as human beings. We cry out to the Lord, God, I, I need liberation, I need freedom, I need victory in my life, I need you. But then we're not willing to let go of the things that are destroying us. I am or at least I was when I was a kid. I don't care to find out now. But when I was a kid, I was highly allergic to bees. Now, if I kept saying to the Lord, I really wish I wouldn't swell up when I got stung by bees, but then I turn around and I keep poking beehives, I got to stop doing that. <laughs> I got stung by a wasp couple years ago, but I don't think that's quite the same thing. Anyway, <laughs> the point here is this. Stop poking the nest. Put what needs to be put at the altar, down at the altar, let it go. That's when the blessing comes about, when you exchange the curse for the blessing. Abraham knew that in order to follow through with God's blessing on his life, the covenantal seed that he was sowing, he needed to sacrifice and lay down his life. So then, that's my question for you at this point is, is that you? Do you have something that, are you in that position where you're saying, I got to stop poking the nest. I've got something that I need to put down and put at the altar. Today's the day to stop wrestling with it, to get your freedom from it, and put it, put it down at the, uh, at the altar, lay it down at his feet. In Genesis chapter 33, verses 18 through 20, Jacob, one of Abraham's descendants, comes to Shechem, and this place is going to be important. I'll, I'll sh show you why here in a little bit. But he comes to Shechem, the same place as Abraham, and he does, interestingly enough, the same thing. So in 33, verses 18 through 20, after Jacob came to Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. And there he set up what? An altar. And he called it El Elohe Israel. 
I think this is important because he came to the same place that his grandfather had come to and did the same thing. This line, this family, would eventually lead us down the road to Christ. There's a clear emphasis in scripture then that this place is important and that this lineage is important. The key thing then to kind of gather as we, we, we're going to move on to the third point here, but the key thing to keep in mind from this is that the blessing gets exchanged at the altar. God wants to shower you with his love. He wants to shower you with his blessing, but you need to lay down your sin and your secrets. You'll find that the things you need to leave at the altar pale in comparison to the blessings that he has for you and the good, good things that he has in store for your life. Sometimes it hurts to lay things down at the altar, but then that's kind of why we call it sacrifice, is that it's not going to feel good, but it's important. If altars are places where life is taken, then what are wells? Places where life is given and saved. And then this is going to be our third point here, the well. We're going to draw the two previous points together, and I'm going to show why all this has been so significant. We see details that we read over all the time in the Old Testament that sometimes it's just sort of like extra detail that we don't really seem to pay attention to. We just kind of read along. But when you tie everything together and you begin to see what's going on in the background, it's interesting to see how God works. We're going to turn now to John 4. This is a very familiar story for a lot of us. It's the story of Jesus and the woman at the well. There's a lot of theological significance here. There's a lot of things we could talk about. But I think we're going to look at it at a little bit of a different angle this morning. John 4, and it's going to be verses 4 through 14. He had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property Jacob had given his son Joseph. And before I get too far ahead, Sychar is another name for Shechem. It's the same area. All right. And Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her. It was probably 100 degrees like it is today. For his, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? She asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Notice what she says here. You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did this, uh, his sons and his livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. Her question to Jesus is quite interesting, I find. You aren't greater than Jacob, are you? How little, how little did she know? who she was talking to, and what the significance of what was going on. Has anyone seen the show Undercover Boss? I don't know if it's still on, okay. Um, I don't know if it's still on TV or not, but here's the, the premise behind it. CEOs, managers, the, the big wigs of companies go undercover as frontline agents, and they get to work with some of the people who work in their company. Um, it's interesting then from when they when they go about doing this, what, how the employees talk. Some of them have some pretty fine things to say. Yeah, it's a great company to work with. It's a great place. 
other times, if you watch some of the episodes, they they badmouth the very CEO that's standing right next to them undercover. So it's a uh, it's an interesting show. But one episode in particular kind of stuck out to me. There was the uh, the CEO of I think it's pronounced Models Sporting Goods, and he was behind the scenes working with a lady that at one of his uh, department stores. He was really impressed and moved by her. She had a great work ethic, great personality, um, wonderful lady. And she, of course, she doesn't know that he's the CEO, right? Because he's in disguise. But he comes to find out that this amazing worker of his, this wonderful person that he's gotten to know, is homeless. Not even just homeless, but they're living in a shelter because she can't barely afford to feed her kids. So she's really reliant, uh, she's really not in a, a very good position, she's really just trying to get by. But she carries this great attitude with her and he notices that. Anyway, at the end of the episode, the bosses always get to reveal who they are. And so for those who had the not so kind words to say about their boss, when the reveal happens, it's kind of funny to watch that happen. Um, but with her, she gets to the end of this episode, not knowing who this guy is that she's talking to, right? Um, and he reveals himself. He says, hey, I'm not just some new entry-level worker. I'm actually the CEO, and you're, you've really touched me. As a matter of fact, he gives her a $14,000 a year raise, promotes her, and then on top of that, he cut her a check in that moment for a quarter million dollars to buy herself a house. They're both in tears. I was in tears watching it, and I'm sitting here. It's late at night, and I'm like, okay, Eric, come on. But it was, it was such a touching episode. It was wonderful to see. And how little did that woman know when she first got to, to, to talk to the boss? She didn't know it was the boss at the time. How little did she know the kind of blessing that was going to happen later on? And the same thing then with the woman at the well. Except the man that the woman at the well met gave her something that even the CEO of that company couldn't offer. He can bless her, sure. He could do a lot of, of wonderful, great things. But Jesus gives far, far more than any individual person or anybody, period, on this planet can give. And all of this is taking place in an interesting spot. The place where Jesus meets the woman is Sychar. Remember I had mentioned that Sychar is kind of the, it's the same abouts area of Shechem. It's the same area. It's the same place where Abraham's promise created an altar. Remember that sacrifice gets exchanged for blessing at the altar, right? The same place where Jacob himself built an altar, but later on built a well in the same spot. We dig wells when we're expecting life. We, we need to be able to feed ourselves, or not feed ourselves, but to, to have water. But how little, how little did Jacob know the prophetic significance of what was going on here? He dug a well to sustain this temporary life. And years after he passed, one would come about who would establish a well of eternal life. Genesis 12, 6 says, Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree at Morah, at Shechem. Thousands of years later, Jesus Christ, God's fulfillment of promise, would meet his earthly end at a tree of his own at the cross of Calvary. It's the combination of these two things. The, the altar, the place of sacrifice and death, and then the well, the fountain of life and hope. And then here comes... Jesus. Jesus himself, a direct descendant of Abraham and Jacob. How interesting is it that the seed promised to Adam and Eve, Jesus Christ, found himself at a place known for both life and death. Genesis 3.15, the serpent seed and Adam's seed. What would Satan's seed be? Why do we have an altar to begin with? It's because of death. Why do we have death to begin with? Sin. 
And we have Satan to thank for contributing to that. The seed of Adam, Jesus. Adam's seed, the seed of promise. The hope through God's plan of salvation is at a place of altar and wells in Shechem, whose name just so happens to be, or to mean in English, shoulder. This sacrificial lamb would shoulder the weight of the sin of the world on himself, and he would bear our burdens and our sin and our, our misfortunes and everything that we would encounter in life. He would weigh it on himself. The altar was important because without the altar, there wouldn't be sacrifice. There wouldn't have been a well. Without the well, there wouldn't have been a seed of promise being fulfilled. Not only this, but he promises, he promises us life eternal if we put our faith and our trust in him. D.L. Moody put it this way, it is a peculiar thing you cannot get any instruction in the Bible as to how to conduct a funeral, for Jesus broke up every funeral he ever attended by raising the dead. The reason being, the one who gives life and gives it eternally promises that there is no such thing as an eternal funeral for the Christian. So this is what he does. He turns altars into wells. He turns death into life. He turns promise into provision. He turns graves into gardens. The woman at that well thought that she was coming for water. Oh, church, she got water all right. There's so much more. She stepped up to a well dug by her ancestor Jacob on the spot where the altar was built by Abraham expecting a blessing, a promise, and now she's speaking to the one who promises her eternal life and gives her a well that will never, ever, ever run dry. How amazing is our God. Don't just focus on the altar. That well got built for a reason, because his emphasis, and what he wants you to know here today, is that it's about life. It's not about the sin. Okay, sin, sin happened, and that's, it's the tragedy of the matter, and we're going to take it seriously, but he didn't stop at an altar. Well got, a well got built, and well, wells give life. And then here comes one building a well of eternal life. I don't know where you're at, today if you're you're doing you you say you know my my walk is okay with the lord i feel great feel wonderful feel supercharged or if there's things that maybe we need to put down at the altar don't be afraid to do that if you need somebody to pray with you to walk with you through that i'm more than happy to talk with you if you need somebody to pray with let's meet let's chat I'm going to close here in prayer, and Belinda will wrap us up in a a quick song. Father God, you are amazing, Lord. You're so, so good to us, God, that you see our sin, but you also see our salvation. You will walk us through the darkest, darkest nights into the light and into the mountaintops, God, and you will meet us there. Wherever we are, we will see you also. We cannot run. We can't hide from your presence. We love you, Lord. Thank you so much for your goodness to us, God. I pray, God, if there is anything that any of us are needing to leave down at the altar, that today is that day. We drop it at the altar, and we exchange the curse for a blessing. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? 
Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Sing, bow down before him, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, oh what a Savior, isn't he wonderful, isn't he wonderful, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you're hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. And if you've come to the end of yourself, if you thirst from a drink for a drink from the well, Jesus is calling. Amazing. Good sermon. Message. Whatever we want to call it. All right, guys. You are dismissed for today. Thank you so much for coming and uh, worshiping with us today. And we will see you hopefully at some of the campsite festivities this weekend. Bye, guys.